is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing a mentor of mine for decades, Teresa Duncan of Odyssey Management, Inc. She received her master's of science degree in healthcare management from Marymount University and has worked in healthcare for over 20 years. Her company, Odyssey Management, offers online courses and training materials for insurance coordinators and managers. She's worked at every position in the dental office that didn't require a license, from taking out the trash to answering the phones on the front line to managing the whole operation. You can find her giving insurance and management courses at meetings like CDA, Yankee, and Rocky Mountain. She's plugged in with office managers and insurance coordinators across the country who depend on her for regular updates on PPOs and claim management. She's been named one of the top 25 women in dentistry by Dental Products Report in 2015 and is in that big issue of Dentistry Day under Leaders in Dental Consulting. She just put out a great book for teams who have to deal with insurance, which is almost all of my peeps, called Moving Your Patients to Yes, Easy Insurance Conversations. Teresa, I've been a fan of yours for 20 years. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And Ryan, too. <laughs> oh, Ryan. So, yeah, you got a boy, and uh, uh, Ryan is... Uh, when Ryan graduated from college, I said, what are you going to do, Ryan? He says, well, Dad, your your show really sucks, so I'm going to come. <laughs> he says, it really needs some help. So he says, I'm going to move back in home with you for a while to get your, your show to uh, where it needs to be. You know, when you ask people what percent uh, take PPOs, well, 95% of the dentists take Delta, and isn't Delta a PPO? It is a PPO, and it's the big gorilla in the room. Everybody's taking Delta, what and they're hating it. What percent it. do you think take Delta? I'd say you're about right with the 95%, some form of Delta, like the, the Premier or the PPO. And, you know, we've got people that are hanging on to the Premier thinking it's going to be around forever. And I just don't see that happening. So um, I, I think it's a pretty, I would say definitely over 90% of the market. I don't have numbers on that. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's, well, if you look at Delta's, if you go to any of their, um, well, it, it's kind of a bad rap to say Delta because there's about 19 different Deltas, right? Yeah. And um, so there's Delta of Arizona, there's Delta of California. But if you go to any of their websites, the first thing they do is they brag on their market share. I mean, they'll say, buy our insurance because it's, it, and that you, number's always over 95. It's 95, 96, 97, yeah. some states 98. So, so um, would you call Delta Premier a PPO? Um, yeah, sure. Because they ask you to reduce your rates in exchange for basically them trying to fill your chairs or filling your chairs. So, yeah, I do. I would consider it a PPO. So, so basically, an insurance, a PPO, is a volume discount. So basically, I can sell you a, a Tonka toy truck for 10 bucks, but mm -hmm. if Walmart says we want to buy 100 of them for, you know, then we're not paying 10 bucks. We're, we're only going to pay 8 bucks. So, so yeah. I've always thought insurance, at the end of the day, was just a volume discount. And I always thought it was interesting how... Dentists won't blink at reducing their fees 40% to sign up for a PPO. And then when you say, well, hey, um, you know, half of America doesn't have dental insurance. Why don't you spend 5% of collected on advertising for the half of America without dental insurance? And they go, nah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to spend 5% getting someone without insurance. I'd just drop my fee 40%. You see you that? Know you know, what's funny about that is that it, it's all about like they're worried that they're not going to have a tangible result from spending five or eight percent on your marketing. They're they're thinking if I spend this amount, then I must get this in hand and they're not going to get that. Now, your prior analogy where you said, you know, if Walmart gets the price down to eight dollars a price or eight dollars a piece for 100 sales. So the argument there is that you would have 100 sales, but that's not guaranteed being on the, the PPO plan. You're basically just. Um, hoping that people walk in the door and dentists are reducing their fees by 30, 40 percent. And there's no guarantee that those patients are still going to come in the door and see you. So it's just it's a weird like you said, they're not spending money on marketing. They cry about it. But then 40 percent of a write off is not that big of a deal to them. They don't even negotiate their fees a lot of times, which is a little frustrating for me. So I would love to see them at least try to negotiate, just give it a little bit of an effort. So what is the best place for them to buy your book, Moving Your Patients to Yes, Easy Insurance Conversations? Yeah. Would that, would that be on your website, Odyssey yeah. Management? OdysseyMGMT.com. And where so did I you come up with the name Odyssey? I know your name, Teresa Duncan, is because your father owned Dunkin' Donuts. So, but <laughs> where did you get Odyssey Management? So Odyssey Management, my I, I double majored in college. I was pre-med and then classics, philosophy, and religion. And I oh always like, 
Yeah, go figure. <laughs> and then I, I, my, I really liked the Odyssey. That was like one of my favorite uh, books to translate and to analyze. And so to me, Odyssey is being on a journey. And that was where I started. I thought, you know what, this is perfect for what I'm doing. Because, you know, when you start out being a speaker consultant, you don't know if anybody's going to come listen to you. You just kind of hope. So <laughs> so it was a real journey for me, getting so, out of private practice. So there's a book called The Odyssey? Yes, Homer. <laughs> oh, and when was that written? Oh, my God, that's ancient Greek times. Wow, and, that, and you're a big fan of Homer in his book, The Odyssey? <laughs> The whole the whole idea of ancient civilizations is amazing to me that you yeah. have all these civilizations that managed to come up with math, um, the basics of math and language and philosophy. And here we are sitting around with smartphones. We can't come up with very much that's original anymore because they did it all back then. It, that's amazing to me. And, the and every building. civilization had a religion, too. I thought that was very yeah. interesting. And yeah, you, you were yeah. a religion major. Does that mean you were a hippie or were you religious? Uh, neither more like just seriously curious yeah. so that's that's pretty much me but I I did like five I did five years of Latin and so when you're a Latin you take a lot of Latin classes you just kind of end up taking a lot of Greek and history Greek history classes art history um, and that was kind of my fun stuff because my mom had it set that I was going to go to med school so that was a great disappointment to her that I ended up not going to medical school um, so we were talking earlier, I'm half Asian. So when you got an Asian mom and you tell her you can't go to medical school or you don't want to, there's fireworks. So <laughs> that's funny. But yeah, so, to, um, Latin pretty much lifted everything from the, the Greeks before them. Yeah. Oh, the Greeks are the, the, they're the OGs. They're the original everything. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, and I haven't, I wish I, I should make more time and go back to that kind of stuff. Cause I used to just sit around and read all of the plays and the dramas. And so that's fun stuff to me. But I haven't gotten back to it recently. I'm too busy doing this stuff, dentistry. <laughs> well, you're, um, well, this is a, a very big pain point in dentistry. So, I mean, basically, in a nutshell, I graduated, uh, my, my dental office just turned 30 years. And when I graduated in 87, Delta paid me 1000 for a crown and 1000 for a molar root canal. Now, 30 years later, I get 600 for a crown, 600 for a root canal, Yet every time the earth went around the sun, my staff all wanted a dollar raise and inflation lifted the cost of, of, of my electrical, my goods, my supplies. So, so you're supposed to do everything better, faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost. And, and this insurance is huge because when they drop your revenue 40%, yeah. I mean, imagine, imagine if American Airlines in the United said, you know what? Southwest Airlines is number one. They have 27% of the market. We're going to reduce all of our fees to beat Southwest Airlines. Well, they'd be bankrupt in 90 days because their cost is... The only secret to lower prices is uh, lower cost. Yeah. And these dentists signed up for these PPOs, but they sure as hell didn't lower their overhead 40%. No. And overhead, you know, gets away from an office. That I mean, the doctor can't control staff and all that kind of stuff. So the conundrum is we have really good long-term uh, employees but there are legacy employees who cost us more. So there's that, you know, that that's hard to get around. So we're not reaching the point yet where we have like unions and legacy costs, but that's a pretty decent analogy. We can't, we, it's really hard for us to control our operating costs. Dentists aren't necessarily good at that. They're, they're just not, they don't take any classes on that or anything. So this whole insurance thing is, is supply and demand. There's too many dentists. The networks don't even need us that much. So, so imagine losing 30 to 40 percent without even planning on it. So maybe you think you're going to get off a of PPO when you go through the motions. But what happens if you get a letter in the PPO saying, "By the way, you're off of our network. We don't need you anymore." That's what I'm hearing a lot of. So I don't, I don't know if many of these dentists out there are ready to just lose 20 to 30 percent of their patients or to have that conversation. So, and then these dentists will go buy a practice. They'll get out of school and they'll go buy a practice. Labor should be 28% max. That's max. Yep. You know, 25 to 20, but that's max. That's FICA matching. That's health insurance, 401k, total max. And yeah. they're buying these offices that are 38% labor. And then you buy this office and I can't go to you and say, well, Teresa, I know you've been with me 30 years and I gave you a dollar raise every time the earth went down the sun. But right now you're making uh, $38, $32 an hour as my and I got to reduce that to uh, 16. Yeah. And, and, and if you say yes, now you come to work passive aggressive and Amy. But anyway, my, my, my CEO friends that own DSOs, they say they would just rather start a de novo because going into an office, 
buying it, the only way they can fix labor is they have to fire all the legacy employees because <laughs> they're, they, they entered dentistry when crowns were a thousand and root canals were a yeah. thousand. Oh, sure. And now those are both 600 and they still in this deal that, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm in expensive dentistry and yeah. I'm a baller and I, this is the kind of money I make. And they're like, I mean, most hygienists will make $40 an hour and they're doing a PPO cleaning. That's only $40 an hour. $40. Yeah, and they're not they're not talking treatment either. So, I mean, there's a lot of really good hygienists out there, but what I've noticed is that when you have that culture of being having to be fast, efficient, let's turn them over, you're just not going to have it. You're not going to attract the kind of people who need to talk about treatment, who, who want to talk about treatment. So, yeah, I, I think we're in a really difficult place today with insurance. One thing that I, I will tell you that I see, and I, you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, I think the hardest part of being a business owner is not the dentistry. Honestly, it's not the insurance. I think it's always the people. It always comes back to the people. And and when you um, when you start out as an associate, you know a lot of your your homies on Dental Town they'll start out as an associate and then plan to take a look at you know plan to open their own office. What I tell them is don't pay attention to what the doctor's doing in the operatory or what the you know what the PPO plans are doing. Pay attention to the leadership. If it's good leadership, you emulate that. If it's bad leadership, you know what the heck not to do when you get out there. It's the people skills that are going to really crash and burn an office after uh, over the long run, I think. Yeah, I also think it's funny where they'll, they'll have this, you know, life is an attitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. And they'll be saying, oh, I hate it. I'm working in corporate. I can't wait to get on my own. And then I'll ask them, like, five simple business questions. And I'm like, yeah. you fool, you, you work for a company that manages 500 offices. Do you think yeah. maybe... Somewhere in that corporation, maybe somebody knows a little bit more than you. You know, and I, I think of all you could learn. I mean, hell, you could just steal all their documents and 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 put your name on them. I mean, I mean, <laughs> God, all the business you could learn in a company that has fifty to five hundred offices. You know, I'm just I'm curious, Howard, because I know you are lecturing in in dental schools, and you get asked to go in and lecture dental schools. And I've done a quite, I've done a small amount of those. I, I don't understand why that's just, why they're not calling us to talk more and more about that in the dental schools. I mean, are, I they, then the reason I hear is that the D3s and D4s are just too busy. They don't want to hear about the business. But I, I think that that's just a wrong way to go. Do you see that changing in academia or, or no? Well, your mind, your, you're not ready to learn. You, you, your your mind is not ready to learn until you're ready. I mean, I remember with all four of my boys, you know, when they uh, before they turned 16 and got their driver's license, they were a passenger. So mm -hmm. when they're driving, they're texting, they're talking to me or whatever. But as soon as you put them in the car seat, they're like, yeah. well, wait, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I would do <laughs> I've driven here a hundred times. They weren't paying attention. So when you're I in just dental had school, conversation. <laughs> so when you're in dental school, you're just trying to you just want to graduate. And then when you graduate, then they just think they want a job. And the problem with the, uh, their, their job is the fact that if your dad paid for dental school and yeah. you're, uh, you get married and have no kids and you have no debt and you have no kids uh, and you and your wife from dental school each get a job at corporate and you're making a buck fifty, hell, you're making $300,000. You have no overhead. You have no debt. You're, you're a baller. Yeah. But if you sit there and you come out of dental school $350,000 in debt because your daddy wasn't a rich dentist and paid for it, um, or you got married in dental school and had a kid and now you're $500,000 in debt, or you went to two years afterwards and become a periodontist, pediatric dentist, orthodontist, whatever, and they're coming out $600,000 in debt, you could never pay that off mm -hmm. getting a job as an associate. You no. use too much of other people's money, and now you can't even buy a practice for seven fifty. dollars you need to go buy a one million dollar practice that has eighty thousand dollars a month in free ca in cash flow to pay that back in ten years. So a lot of them they 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 don't realize that if you use other people's money past a certain red line in the sand, you're yeah. going to have to own your own business. Yeah. Well, and, and and there's not a lot of those million dollar practices that aren't being snapped up by the larger corporations anyways, or the the DSOs themselves. So it's hard to compete in that market, just building out. Doing de novo is great, but now you, then you got to find a place that has cheap construction, that has a, a multitude of clients that, or patients. I call them clients, but patients. So, I mean, that, I think it's very difficult nowadays to be a business owner, more so than it was when you were starting out. I mean, I've, I've been in it 20 years. I started out with my dentist 
a lot of the business decisions he has to make now are way more complicated than he ever did way back then. So well, I, I would say I would say that's true in where half of America lives in the urban 119 yeah. largest uh, city uh, metropolitans. But like, um, but I see so many dentists where their mom uh, came from Asia, uh, your mm -hmm. mom came from Vietnam, their yeah. mom came from Brazil, or their their mom or dad immigrated from another country, and then they graduate from dental school in in downtown UMKC. And I say, well, your mom came from India. Why don't you go two hours away from town? And I yeah. just found a little county of 6,000 people in the county, and it has a little city of 1,200, and there's no dentist there. And every time a dentist goes there, no insurance, no PPOs. They set up their 1,000 for a root canal, 1,000 for a crown. They'll do a million dollars and take home $350,000 a year, yeah. and those millennials just say no. They don't want to live no, there. I'm going to live in they, downtown they Kansas City. Yeah. So you know, so I was just in Vegas and they were saying there's so many offices opening up in Vegas that there are wait, there's waiting lists now for the contractors because there's no good contractors. That was another thing I thought was interesting. Um, people have left the left Vegas. So now you have a waiting list for contractors to even build out the practices, but they're still flocking there. So you're right. You go a couple thousand miles out, you have the world, but everybody wants to live near a city and, you know, airport. I get it. Well, I get the, it. The, the rule of thumb is, is um, if you're, if you're if you want to find a dental office that doesn't take insurance, so yep. instead of saying, I mean, you you call most dental offices, how much is a crown? Thousand, and I would say, why do you say that? Because ninety five percent of the crowns you're doing are on a PPO fee, and you've yeah. adjust, and your adjusted production was down to six hundred. Then I say, right. well, what percent of your practice you want to build? And, well, I want to build the cash. Well, why do you if you want to build the cash? Why do you give them a forty percent penalty? So you <laughs> so you tell everybody that you charge a thousand for a crown. But then when they come in and bring in their insurance, you adjust off 600. But that, yep. but that 50% of America without dental insurance, all they heard was a thousand for a crown. So they hang out and they call the X out a thousand, 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 thousand. Yeah. And and uh, so why is if your cash price is only being realized by five percent of the market, why is it 40% higher than all your fees? But the mm -hmm. only people I know that have the cash price where they're getting a thousand for a crown, a thousand for a canal, or twelve fifty for a crown and yeah. twelve fifty for a root canal, they all same thing. They're all in a town of under five thousand, two yep. hours away from a major airport. And they'll That's work four ten hour days yep. and they'll make they'll pay off all their student loans in a year or two. And uh, and then they'll just uh, commute in for the weekends. I, I'll never forget this couple that came to see me at Star of the North. Oh, my. They were adorable. It's a husband and wife. She's the dentist. He's managing the practice. And he, they were telling me that they are the only two employees of this office. It's just them. And they live in a similar situation. They're outside the skirts of uh, Minneapolis. They have a uh, very busy, robust practice. They only work as many days as they want. They have low overhead because they bought an old building, renovated it themselves. Low overhead. It's just the two of them. They answer the phones, they return phone calls, but they don't need to answer it live all of the time. They submit their own claims, everything. And this is what cracked me up. Instead of, you know, the morning huddle, they told me they have a morning cuddle. <laughs> oh, my God. So that's a man and wife? It was a man and wife. And I said, do you remember you their names? I so want to podcast them it's like three or four years ago. If they're listening, contact Howard. They were so adorable. But, you know, I said, do you want to grow? What do you want to do? And they said, you know, they were just taking my class to make sure they were doing things right with insurance. And they said, we're happy if we want to close the office and go, you know, camping, they can. If they want to spend time with their kids. They make sure they block it out on the schedule like that. They're so they were so simplistic that it was really jarring for me to hear that because you don't hear that. You hear grow, grow, grow. Let's more operatories, more offices, more space. And here's these people that are they were so you could see them that they were just happy. Well, here, the, well, we were talking earlier about legacy, where you know the problem is a lot of these dentists. If you go look at the economics of their business, all they are is job providers. Yeah. That, that's all they do. I mean, all they were born with the sole mission to do almost free dentistry and create jobs, mm -hmm. and that comes from back when. These insurance companies were paying bank thousand for yeah. ground, thousand for canal. Now yeah. that the fees have come down to uh, where they're at, um, and that's why I love lecturing around the world. I mean, I, I'm in I'm in five continents. I was in five continents last year. Other awesome. other of these countries have been through this deal, and what they end up coming back to is that this 
high production facility of running three chairs with all these assistants and all these insurance and all that stuff, it just it just doesn't work. And yeah. then you find the most profitable dentists are going back to that one chair, no employees, one dentist. Maybe his mom. I've seen it several times in Singapore where maybe yeah. his mom is the assistant and then works the phone and the phone is their is her iPhone and uh, they go back to uh, where they say okay we're only going to gross 400 this year but I'm going to take home 300. Yeah. How how did you like lecturing in Singapore? Cuz I, I I did that a couple years ago and it was so hot, so hot. That's all I remember really, just so hot. I always know <laughs> where I'm at by looking at the um the uh, satellite antennas because you know when you go up to like uh Moscow <laughs> And Warsaw and, and uh, Quebec, they're yeah. almost at a right angle on the roof because they're all oh. going to the equator. Yeah. But when you go to Singapore, they're all facing straight up. I mean, Singapore <laughs> is like one degree south of the equator, yeah. so every every side is straight up. So, what do you what do you think the pain points are for insurance? So, so I I think no one's confident in what they're talking about. I mean, that's a lot of the reason why I wrote the book. I've got a lot of people that take my class, and they're saying. I can't give patients a really good estimate on how much is owed because the insurance company keeps changing what is going on with their benefits. And it's not like they're changing it to be super malicious. It, it changes at regular intervals. But when you've got an office who's got you know steady flow of patients, they don't have the time to sit on the phone and call and get benefits all the time. But that's what we end up having to do. So if I go in and I say it's going to be 80 percent, you know, your, your portion is going to be 20 percent. I have to be pretty confident in that or my patient's going to smell that. And then, then we get the bad review. So I just get a lot of people who don't feel comfortable talking to patients about their insurance because they're not sure they're correct all of the time. And, and, you know, they're changing the plan structure. They're changing networks. Doctors are finding out they're on networks before, you know, they even get notifications in the mail that they even get something. Patients are telling them which network they're on. That's what's funny. You know, and that's I don't know if that's happened to any of your actually probably not to you. I'm sure to the people on Dentaltown, you know, they'll get a call and the patient will swear up and down that you're on their plan. You go to check the plan and sure enough, your name is on there. So it is it's a uh, you've got people who just don't know for sure what they're talking about and they know it. And the patients smell that a mile away. And so as a result, you're having a hard time closing treatment. So I, I'm I, I re, I'm reading the forums. I lurk on your forums. and I definitely see that. Um, you know, that, that they'll, they'll tell a patient something and EOB comes back looking completely different. So it seems like when I find an office that's dotting the I's, crossing the T's, they actually call another human for yeah. every single time. Um, do you, yeah. what do you recommend? Do you recommend that if you're a high volume practice, you need a full time person that you can just sit there and dial insurance companies and talk to humans? Or yeah. have you found third-party um, companies that uh, do this uh, as well, uh, better and cheaper and faster? I, you know, what? I, I, there's a couple of comp companies who are doing that right now. Outsource. They're they're the ones who can sit on the phone all day and talk. Um, it's getting better and better. I think it, it's still a wide market. If anybody is out there thinking about, you know, I want to stay in dentistry, but I want to start a business, that's a wide open market right now. We've got a couple companies doing it well, but like. I know some that are doing it that they have a waiting list, and and that's fantastic for to them. get on, to get to be a client, yeah. So that what, they can what, call. What, and get can you give us names of those companies? Mary, well, Mary Beth is very busy. Mary Beth Bajorna, she's got dental support um, specialties, and from what I'm hearing, you know, she does a really good job. But she's in know, she's in Cleveland. Yeah, right yeah. by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and and there's another lady that I work with, um, insurance billing outsourcing. Her name is Leslie Eisnogel. And she's she's the same way. She's getting seriously busy. So how I think do, there's a lot spell, of room. What, what's Mary Beth Bohornis' website? Uh, I mm, it's Dental Support Specialties is the name of the company. Yeah, you're right. And then Leslie Eisnogel is uh, InsuranceBillingOutsourcing.com. See, my thumbs are too fat for an iPhone. That's that's my problem. I need to lose <laughs> weight just to I'll lose weight if it comes out of my thumbs. <laughs> okay. And then what is uh what how do you spell Leslie's uh, last name? So, uh, I C E N O G N O G L E I C E N O G L E insurance billing outsourcing.com. I think, yep. Insurance billing outsourcing.com. So you recommend these two companies. Yeah. And I, you know what, I make a point of, of knowing that they have a, it's a, it's anywhere from, you know, $500 to $2,000 a month, depending on your volume. 
other than that, I don't know the specifics, but here, here's my thing. You know, I managed offices for a while and I've had great staff, medium staff, awful staff. When you're outsourcing something like this where they're just on the phone all day, it's somebody who's taking up space, taking up your phone. I'd rather just give it to somebody else. And it's one less person I have to deal with, too, from a manager point of view. That's one less personality in the office. So if I were going to outsource anything, I'd definitely outsource that. Um, but, the you know, the other thing, too, Howard, is that we, we have uh, a whole generation of doctors who have managers who run everything. And the person who ends up taking over the insurance is the manager just because she's usually the one who's got her hands in everything. And it is turning into a full time job. Then they find out that the managerial stuff has kind of gone by the wayside because this person's spending 100 percent of their time on insurance. So I, I'm really out there trying to say, look, if you want to really get a hold of insurance in your office, you need a full time person that's going to be taking a look at this or else, you know, you're you're really losing money. Well, I, I in MBA school at ASU, they said um, that when it comes to outsourcing, it's a very simple question. Can, can you add value to this? Like like I have a dental town magazine. Yeah. And so the, the company that prints it, I don't buy a printer because the printing thing, I can't add value to the printing. Yeah. But the guy that does the printing in my magazine, he runs it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The sure. printer costs about $5 million. And when they turn it on, they never shut it off. And then after about three years, they throw it away. But so the question is, when you call and verify the insurance, well, there, there's no customer service magic there's no new patient experience i mean that's mm -hmm. that's an algebra equation you can't really what what you're saying is you can't, you can't really add value to that no and you know i've i got i got offices uh, doctors are fighting with me too sometimes after class they'll come up and say you know you're telling me to spend more money to participate with insurance and my my pushback to them is look at your best person who's doing insurance. The smartest person is doing all of your insurance. Just take a look at her and see what she's doing all day. She's constantly running behind because she's always on hold with some insurance company, which means she's not talking to your patients, which means she's not working on improving the reports. She's just on the phone waiting to hear 80%, 70%, 60%. So if you want to keep paying somebody to do that, great, but I'm telling you there's a better way. I, that's that's my pushback. So, but you know, traditionally there's been in dentistry a resistance to outsourcing. There's that's that's pretty resistant. Uh, I just don't. I think we are at a tipping point now where people are realizing it doesn't always have to be the staff that's up front that we can see every day. It can be other other things. You know, like the appointment reminders, um, the electronic claims. All of that can be outsourced, and the marketing can be outsourced. It doesn't have to be your person up front who's trying to do 500 different things. And, and poor office managers, you know, I talk to a lot of them uh, across the country and, and they're always, they just don't have time. They're expected to do pretty much everything. They're the, you know, the girl Friday or the man Friday. And that's, that's all they do is kind of put out fires. Wow. So, so your two, um, your two were uh, Lisa Isingalo. Ice no What is it? Ice Nogle. Like she'll say. Oh, I, Ice I, Nogle. Okay. I see yeah, that word. I, Ice Nogle. Yeah, I yeah, snuggle. Like, I snuggle. You snuggle is what she used to say. That's is she how from I Iceland. That. I have no idea. She's blonde, like, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, she's Icelandic, and her website is insurancebillingoutsourcing.com. Yeah, and then there's the most talented, beautiful Mary Beth. Bo how do you pronounce her name? Bajornis. But Bajornis, I think. Bajornis. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, um, Patterson had me lecture at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a couple months ago. Which so is cool. so damn cool. I don't. I didn't realize that I was flying in there. I was telling the lady sitting next to me that I, that's what I was coming down to do. And she says, look at the building. Look at it. It's shaped like the old phonograph. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah I did notice that. Yeah. I, had, I had no idea. Like, like on what was that record label that Elvis Presley was on when we were little that, with the dog and the phonograph? And, um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah no, and, I don't know. and you take these escalators up, and on the very top of the room was this little rock and roll place where they, you know... Um, performed and and uh it was just so damn cool anyway, did, her you her see the, did you see the wall did you see the pink floyd the wall i i thought that was pretty cool i was walking into it and when i looked up i realized holy crap this is the wall i like i didn't it just kind of looked like an exhibit and that was that was awesome so you know it took me back a little bit and then the best thing about it is when it was over as i was as we were leaving there was these uh two old ladies that drove like from several hours they went to go to the rock and roll hall and they had no idea they thought it was a museum. They had no idea it was so expensive to get in. So me and uh, my dentist buddy, we gave them all of our dental uh, our dental deal and told them to go in there and you know, as they were dentists, 
So they walked in and used our name tags and I got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for free. So that was even more important. So if they go to um, odysseymanagement.com, um, they can buy your book there, order yeah. your new book now, uh, $20 plus shipping and handling. And let's, uh, I, uh, I loved your book. Well, let's go through some of the book. Um, sure. Um, so how can dental insurance coordinators move their clients to yes? Um, let, 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 me, let me phrase it with this. Um, so we know that basically the funnel to get into your office. We, we, know, that, we know the average general dentist is doing 650, 650,000 a year, and they're taking home a buck 80. Specialists yeah. are doing a million a year, taking home 320. Those are facts. But to do that, $650,000, 10 people have to land on your shitty website <laughs> which has no YouTube video or anything, Yeah. to yep. convert one to call. Three people have to call before your receptionist, named after a piece of furniture, your front desk gal, with no training, can convert yep. one to come in. And we need three people to come in with a cavity before your crappy treatment plan presentation can get one to convert to getting a drill, fill, and bill. And that's how you get to 650000 So to get one filling, you need three people. To get three people, you need nine calls. And to get nine calls, you need 90 people to land on your shitty website. So my question is, in the conversion when they call, it seems like if, you, if I call you up and I say, um, hello, um, Teresa, um, I, um, I'd like to see the dentist. I broke my tooth. Um, instead of you just going right for get this butt in the chair, well, when would you like to come in? When, yeah. Can you come down right now? Because we have extra chairs. We're not, we don't, we're not waiting around for a chair. That's not our choke point. But it seems like so many receptions go to, well, um, what insurance do you take? Yeah, it's well, the what? first thing they ask for. I know, it's and they blow the conversions. You're supposed to get their ass in a chair. Yeah. And then a lot of times when they get in the chair, in our chair, and they find out, well, we don't take their insurance or this or that, the convenience factor. Yeah. They got a credit card. They bought an iPhone, their car, their house in Disneyland, and they went out to eat sushi last night. They're here. They like you. Yeah. The new pacing experience is great. You know what would really be awesome? It's just for you to do it now, right now. Here's the credit card. So, so I want you to talk about um, how, much in, how much insurance questions should you be asking when your conversion rate on a phone call is less than one in three? You know, the insurance has to be asked. You have to ask about it because, you know, you don't, the, you don't want to upset the patient when they come in, you know, that you, cause they'll feel like you were trying to pull one over on them, but that's like the last thing you should be asking for. So say you call me and you have an emergency, you broke your tooth and I'll say, I'm so glad you called right now because I have an opening and I'd be happy to see you. What could you come in today at four o'clock? You convert them, you get them in, like you said, and then you'll say, I'd love to, I need some information from you though. Can we, can we, can I get some pieces of information before you come in? And then at the very end of that, you find out what's wrong, the tooth, their name, where they found you, all of that stuff. At the end, as you say, um, will you be using any insurance benefits at your visit? And it's not what insurance do you take or not what insurance do you have or type of insurance. Some of these some of these people at the front, it's like they're going down a list and all they, they just need to get through the list. Name, date of birth, address, insurance. Do you know we're in network? Do you know we're out of network? Do you know your benefits? It's so robotic sometimes. That's another thing I love to see outsources listening to the call recordings. Doctors really should be listening to the call recordings and seeing what's being said out there. You know, I did this for so many years and I would slip. I mean, if you were listening to me, I could be on nine times out of 10, but that one time, it's a disaster. Everybody has their off days. So as far as getting the patient in the door, I want to ask them, what benefits will you be using today? And then they'll tell me. And I'll say, okay, I'm really familiar with that plan or I'm not familiar with that plan. How about I get your information and I find out about it and I'll have it ready for you when you come in. And if I find out that it's a loopy plan and we're not going to be covered, we're out of network, I'm going to let the patient know there's an extra expense. It's going to be out of network. It's going to be out of pocket. We'd still love to see you. I want to take care of you today. So I believe we need to be honest with our patients. But so fast are we getting to that insurance point that we're not – we tend to talk about it first and we should be talking about it last is my point. And I think about it too, when I call my, my medical doctor for an appointment, you know, I've been going to her for six, seven years. They still ask me every time I call, what's my insurance before they find out what I need to come in for. 
that's that's how medical is. And I just don't I don't think I think we need to be different from that. So when I wrote the book, there's there's uh, sample conversations in there about how to how to have that first phone call. And it takes practice, too. Just like you guys do fillings over and over again, front office people, they need to practice these conversations. Man, I just wish I could afford to go to the doctor. I, I can only afford to go to the vet. <laughs> better treats. <laughs> so, uh, better treats. Um, you, you wrote an entire chapter on words matter. Oops, just the cleaning, cancellations. <laughs> talk, talk, what, what, do you, um, what, what words do you think matter? So, words like maximum. Maximum really bothers me. And I hear a lot of doctors say this, or, you know, they, they say, it, well, we can go up to your maximum. And it, like, why are you why are you deciding that for the patient? Let the patient decide how much they want to spend with you. But when you start using the word maximum, maximum implies a stopping point in my mind. So when I, you say to me, you'll reach your maximum, I'm already subconsciously going, oh, I better stop. I better wait until the next benefit year rolls over. And that's what offices tend to do. They, they anticipate the objection. And so they make it true. So I, I'd like them to, to take that out of their vocabulary. Just the word maximum. Just get rid of that. I have, yearly four, benefit. I have four boys, Eric, Greg, Ryan, and Zach. And if I had a fifth one, he was going to be named Maximus. <laughs> I love that. A Max is just such a cool <laughs> name. But it's, it's, it's a great name for a boy, but not a great term in dentistry because you think you're influencing their mind. It's time that they've reached their I max. And it's time to stop. I do. I mean, and we hear we're not supposed to say, oh, we had a cancellation. We had a change in the schedule. And, you know, when you hear these things for the first time, there's a lot of us, I did the same thing. A lot of us will go, that's really, you know, you're nitpicking. It doesn't make a difference if you say maximum. It doesn't make a difference if you say cancellation. But in the reality, when you say it enough times, it really does make a difference. So we it, we have to give each other permission to like ball up a piece of paper and throw it at each other if we hear us using those terms. So I, oops, is the very first part of the book. And that's kind of a throwback to my boss. Um, because when I, I was a really bad assistant, like the worst assistant ever. And what I would say a lot when I drop something or when I didn't have something, I go, oops, all the time. And, and he finally, after about six months, he pulled me aside and he said, look, you got to cut this out. You just can't keep saying oops because the patient's thinking like I dropped something. I did something wrong. And it does make a difference. Words do matter. So, But, what, I, but how, what is, how does cancellation, how does that mess with their mind? Well, you're, you're, you're thinking you're, what you're doing is you're setting a precedent that people cancel all the time. So... You know, and it is semantics, but I do think semantics, it, it makes a difference. So you don't want to say, oh, you know, somebody didn't show up for their appointment because what you're doing is saying it's okay if you don't show up for your appointment. So if you're trying to enforce this, everybody shows up for their appointment mentality, when you constantly are telling them there's changes in the schedule or there's cancellations and no-shows, somebody didn't show up, you're saying this is a common occurrence in your office. So we want to make it sound like, oh, we just had an opening just for you. Well, when, when I think of words matter, what, what I um, used to do um, with my associates and others is, you know, I would, um, when smartphones come out and tape recorders, is I, I would tape their, uh, their presentation, mm -hmm. and then I would print it out, and then I would take a black magic marker and write out every damn word that they don't know what it means. You know, they say, well, you know, you have an interproximal uh, lesion on the distal number three, and it's causing irreversible pulpitis, and you're going to need endodontic therapy, yeah. then a post buildup, and a full coverage dressing. I mean, why don't you just fart and leave the room? They have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. I mean, endodontists right now are starting this campaign where they don't like the word root canal. It's got a bad content. So they, they want to they call it endodontic therapy. And all these TMJ idiots, um, they're like, well, it's not TMJ, it's TMD. Dude, all the Americans call it TMD yeah, and root exactly. canals. So if you're anally retentive little bubble world, wants to rename it TMD, uh, why, why don't you go clean all the sand off all the beaches? Um, so, so the bottom line is, you know, we know in the back, they're like, well, you need an MO and a DO and an MOD, and, and, and no one knows what they're saying. But then when I go to the front desk, it's the same. They're yeah. saying, well, do you have a PPO or an HMO? Is this capitation? Sure. Are you preferred? Are you premier? Are you yeah. in network? Are you out of network? It's like, shit, what am I calling you from? Insurance school? I, I well, don't have any idea what you're saying. I need to I need to start an insurance school. That's what I need to do. But there there's like they'll say, what does your EOB say? No one patients don't know what an EOB is. What the heck is an EOB? But we talk about that. You know, it's funny. I used to um, teach implant uh, uh, implant treatment presentation way back when, and I will never forget going to observe in an office. And the doctor was talking about titanium and osseo integration with the patient. I was 
I just, you know, it was like I just nudged him a little bit with my foot, like, stop that. No one wants to hear osseo integration. That's like a horrible word. Nobody wants to And what to does hear. it even mean? I mean, how would this guy know what an osteocyte is, that osseo is Latin for bone? You right. know, I mean, I mean, I mean, these people, it, it, you know what it reminds me of the most is I had to go to Catholic Mass every single day from birth to 17. My mom said you could only miss Mass if you're bleeding in two places. <laughs> so you could have a 104 degree fever, coughing yeah. pneumonia on everyone, and and for the first 10 years it was in Latin, and they just said there you know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean um, you're an eight year old kid. I mean it actually turned out very good because it's actually where I learned to meditate, and mm -hmm. get my daily plan, and then, because you had to unplug, you couldn't do all the things that are distracting you, mm -hmm. and you had to sit there in a pew. And just be alone with your thoughts for an hour. In fact, I actually didn't like it when they switched to English. My mom actually thought it was the end of the world and the end of the church. And the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket because now they're saying mass in English. And, uh, but, I act, but, but now, you know, here I am, 54 years old, you know, 44 years later. And mm -hmm. the only Latin I hear is in dental offices. <laughs> you need a mesial, occlusal, distal, lingual, buccal cervical, interproximal, osteocyte, you know. Um, I'll, but uh, Can I tell you where else we see Latin? Is when I go to check out these websites of these doctors and you still have the lorem ipso, all of that on the website because they never bother to change that. So that's another place you might see Latin. The lorem ipso? <laughs> it's like the... Dummy text that it populates all the parts with. Some websites they just... It's like the slug text, you know, oh, in the website. You have to show that. Website. Yeah, yeah, show and, them, and, right? and also, every <laughs> flyer I get in my mailbox, every piece of drug mail, I say it's a real estate agent or someone wanting your tax business or whatever. They got all this alphabet soup shit behind their name. Yeah. And do you know what any of that means? Oh, what I want to do is I want to sit there and say, Dr. Fran is so smart. He has the entire alphabet behind his name. And they just be like, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, Q, R, X, Y, Z, W, X. I was like, damn, that's one smart dude. He has the entire alphabet behind his name. Uh, it don't mean anything to anything. And, and then, and then, the, then when you track the conversions, you know who has the best conversion rates? Tell I me. mean, this is the, a video world where they land on oh, the website, yeah. and there's a YouTube video, and I punch it, and there's there's Teresa Duncan, and she's saying, I got into this business because when I inherited all the money from Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> I invested it into Odyssey Man. But you know what I mean? Because humans want to feel something. And I'm not going to feel something looking at a bunch of letters behind your name. I'm not going to feel something. Uh, but when I see you talk, yeah. I'm probably going to secrete some dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin. And, yeah. and those conversion rates might be three people land on your website till one picks up the phone. And, and if there's no picture, I mean, a lot of these guys are arguing with me that you can't say conversion rate because a lot of these websites, no one's ever converted. So you, you can't even say it's 1%. It's, 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 you know, and I say, well, it's zero, you know. Well, you got a better chance if you're putting up nice pictures and videos, though. I mean, I go to websites still that have no pictures of anybody, and staff is just coming soon. Staff has been coming soon for years on these websites. They're not, they're not putting them up there. And then you hear, well, I don't want to put up a picture of my staff because what if it changes? Well, what's that about? Of course your staff's going to change, so don't be afraid to do that. Can we go back to the, the shitty website, as you said? Yes. Can we go back for a yes. second? So the whole insurance piece. So when people come to my class, they give me their email because they want to sign up for the newsletter, or whatever. I'm always checking out the domains and I go to every single one of them, most of them. And what I see is the same insurance information on all of these websites. So for your homies out there, let's change it up a little bit. Instead of your financial page or your insurance page saying we accept most insurances. Here's a list. The list is always outdated. Um, call us if you have any questions. Let's do something different and put on there. You can even have a video of somebody doing this. Put on there. If you have any questions about your insurance, we're happy to help you. If you have any questions about your benefits, that's what we do all day, every day. Call Mary, call Jean, put a link to the address, the email address so that they can directly email Jean and find out what's going on with their benefits. But don't put on there, we will be happy to file your claim for you. Well, no, no, duh. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what every other office in the in your county does. So let's do something different and turn it I into love yeah, that. We, we know I love you that. have insurance. So let's make it so that this is our customer service talking point here. Yeah. That is that's, nice. I'd love to see that more. So that's a challenge. Yeah, that's more personal. If you have if you have any if you have any questions 
about your dental insurance, please call our dental insurance coordinator, Robert, at robert at todaysdental.com or 480-893-1223. Click here. Click here to send a message. Nice. Click the chat. I'm loving the chat. I don't and, know if a lot of you people doing that. That's awesome. What's that? They, the chat, the live chat in the offices on the website. And you, so, you like that? You think that's, that's I pretty I love cool? it. The offices I talk to that do it, they love it. Because even if they're offline, something pops up that will say, um, we're not available, but go ahead and put your question in there. We'll get back to you the next day. And you've got questions there. Because everybody's looking at websites at night. Nobody shuts off their laptop at 5.30 in the afternoon. Everybody's looking at night. They want to pay their bill online at night. So please put something on your website so you can get some payment. Just stick, it's a code. Put it on your website. You've spent millions of dollars on code for Dentaltown. The code for getting payment through your website is cheaper. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> So, yeah, any way we can communicate with them and capture them, let's let's do that. Let's get them talking to us, even if we're not open. Let's at least open that conversation. Are there any companies that you like that do that chat? You know, I have I have not known any dental companies that are doing it right now, but that doesn't mean there isn't any out there. The ones who have told me about it anecdotally, they're actually using outside of dentistry office um, chats. Because there's, it's a simple chat program they can put into their website. I'm sure any webmaster will be able to do that. So yeah. I'm no, I'm no marketing expert. Oh, I wouldn't say that. How, why would you say that? <laughs> no, because I, I don't want any calls on that. <laughs> you, you want to say focus on dental insurance? <laughs> insurance and managers. You know, I, I love being, I love being a manager. Love talking to managers. I want to empower them to do more in the office. Okay, and, I want to, I want to ask you uh, one more question yeah. before we get to office managers. Yeah. Um, the difference between a baby dentist five years out of school and an old seasoned dog like me is they get into trouble because the patient talks them into doing unethical things on the insurance or doing dentistry that they didn't, they didn't want to do. Like they'll say, well, I want to do this. And some yeah. 70 year old man, who probably, you know, sold cars for a living convinces this young 26 year old boy that he should do this. And the whole time, this young doctor is thinking, this is a really bad idea, but he gets talked into it. And then a lot of times they'll, 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 they'll I mean, you know this, they'll, they'll try to get the, um, the young receptionist, the young dentist out of school to do something mm -hmm. illegal for the deal. And, and I got a sad story for this. There was a really cool dentist that I used to see at parties uh, back in the 80s. And um, his patient talked him into, well, if they pay half the crown, why don't you just bill two crowns and they'll pay two halves yeah. and then I won't have to do that. And then it worked. So he started doing that. And the next thing you know, the ones he was sending to Delta of Arizona were in state and that was just a criminal. And I mean, that was just a civil and give us money back and fines mm -hmm. and, and go to the board. But the yeah. ones that mailed across the state line, yep. those mail are fraud. federal mail fraud. That's how they put Al Capone in Alcatraz. And that boy went to jail for five years while he had a wife and two kids at home. And his wife was completely off guard. Like, what the hell? One well, day sure. you think your husband's a successful dentist and you're making bank and that life's good. Next thing you know, he's in prison for five years. So talk about what is... Un I mean, do you get this? I mean, you covered, yeah. you wrote a chapter in your book. Yeah. So talk about um, when patients make unethical requests. So patients, you, you know. You just refer them to the Clinton Foundation? Or... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that could help with that, I think, right? Um, so, you know, they do. They come in because the doctor down the street waived their copay or the doctor down the street did that crazy billing. But if I had a dollar for every time a dentist came to me and said, what, here's what I'm doing. Here's the procedure. What codes can I use to get reimbursed for it? And I'm thinking that's not how it works. You don't you don't just do the procedure and then, you know, pick a myriad of codes to come up to the dollar amount of that procedure. So it, it goes back to what's the dentist ethical level. Most of the time, 99% of the time we got good dentists, but it's that 1% that's going to mess it up. But you also have patients who are uh, un, they're not worried about asking you to cut your it's not their license. So they're they're asking for as much courtesy as they can. They go to the mechanic. They're asking they're they're looking for a discount. You know, they're always looking for coupon codes. You can't buy anything on any online store without Googling, you know, um, carbonite coupon codes so that you can find 
a, a, a freebie on that. So the American consumer is used to asking for discounts, but we have to be ethical enough to push back and say no. And so that's what I've got. I gave them some verbiage in the book that, you know, we, we don't do things that way. I understand you may have run into that before, but that's unfortunately we're just we can't do that here at this office. What we can do is X, X, X. But yeah, it's not doctors. This is another thing, too. When you're submitting the insurance claims, all that information that you send in with that claim, that's your butt, too. That's your license on the line, too. So as long as I've been submitting claims for my doctor, you know, and I still do that part time. My old doctor I was with for 20 years. I still do his claims um, on the side. And what I know in the back of my mind is that whatever I send in with x-rays and narratives, if it doesn't match his notes, that's his kid's retirement. And that's his retirement. That's his kid's college so it's not me. They may come after me, but really the real loser is the doctor who trusted me to make the right decision. So it's a, uh, you do hear that a lot. So doctors, especially the young ones coming out of school, you have to remember that you're the business owner and you have to do things to protect the business and, and not, and waiving co-payments and billing, like you said, that guy, that's not the way to do it. You've got to be more ethical. So, um, Office managers, it always seems like, I don't know, half my homies say, I don't believe in office managers. And some of them say, you know, I have um, two dental assistants and one's a lead dental assistant. And I have two girls up front and one's a lead. And then other people say, well, I know I believe that the um, front office should uh, forge an office manager and that there should be someone, there, you need an org chart. Yeah. So some people, the org chart is, I'm the dentist, and the back office, wet hands, and the front office, dry hands, both report to me. I don't believe in the office manager. Some people say, no, I believe in the office manager. And, um, and I think the back office, dry hands, the front office, wet hands should report to a single office manager, then the office manager reports to me. And then the disaster is when there's no org chart. That's usually yeah. when there's a dentist spouse in there, and you have two gods. Remember, the, the three most popular religions are monotheistic. I mean, one God, you know, there's one, one, because like in Hinduism, when you have a God of lightning and a God of thunder, it can start to get confusing, you know, yeah. law. And, and so they'll, they, and they know just like kids, they know if you want this, ask dad, and they know if you want this, ask mom. So they know if they ask the, 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 you know, the, the doctor, uh, this, and they ask the spouse this. So, so you need an org chart. So where do you, where do you think is the best org chart? So the org charts that I love are when the, the there is that one ring to rule them all, you know, the one doctor at the top, the business owner, really. So most of the time, the doctor is a business owner. So let's put that out there. So the doctor's at the top. If, if the doctor has good management skills, not necessarily business skills, but management skills, then maybe you don't need a manager. Maybe you don't. But if you're a big office, if you've got high volume and you're doing a lot of dentistry, chances are you need a manager. So whether or not you need a manager, I think there has to be some in, there has to be investment into learning business and keeping up on business. So if you want to manage your own practice, have at it. But just remember, for every composites course you take, you should be taking a business course as well. So if you're going to take that on on and do that. But most doctors don't want to. They want to have a manager. So if you're going to have a manager, you need to do the same thing. You need to make sure the manager takes up takes the classes that they need to take and, and stays on top of it. You know, HR isn't optional anymore. Um, OSHA isn't optional. HIPAA isn't optional. But that's what I run into all the time is, oh, I'll get to that. Oh, I know I need training on that. I'll get to that. You know, you go over to Walmart or you go over to, you know, Chipotle or McDonald's. All of that is not optional. They make sure their I's are dotted, T's are crossed. No one starts until they've looked at the employee manual. But many dentists will start an employee and then the employee manual has never even got, they don't even get to that until like maybe two weeks later when things die down. Hey, I'd rather, I'd rather eat off the floor of any dental office than at Chipotle. <laughs> and I, I think, know, I think Wall Street yeah. agrees with me on that one. Yeah, I think so. They're in trouble. They're well, in actually, trouble. Which, you know what it is? It, it, it's, it's pushback. I mean, and I, I feel sorry for Chipotle because they did the right thing. They wanted to buy everything local. They didn't, they wanted to buy produce local. Yeah. And then the big buzzword is organic and organic. Well, people don't realize it's like now with the, all, all these anti-vaccination. My friends are pedi pediatricians. I yeah. mean, one fourth of the girls are pushing back on vaccinating their babies. And here we are, 2017. And if we go back 100 years, by 1917, 5% of America had already died from the influenza. Right. And when they came out with the polio vaccine, 
there were parades and people yes. lined up blocks outside the door. My yeah. mom and her brothers um, quit swimming in swimming pools in public swimming pools because they were so afraid of getting polio. Is that right? Wow. And so, so um, where was I? Um, so, so they went to all this organic food that's all organic and natural. What did yeah. it not have? Pesticides. What did it not have? So, so, so now there's all kinds of bugs and you're crapping your brains out because <laughs> you don't understand the value of pesticides. And, well, um, and now, well, and now we, we've had more measles outbreaks this year yes. than the last three years combined just in the state of Detroit versus the so, whole country. And polio is apparently coming back too. You know, I've heard more cases of that. So the whole, I mean, you need herd immunity needs the herd to participate, you know, if you're going to do that. So yeah, the whole vaccination issue uh, that, yeah, let's, t let's go back to management. Yeah. It, well, it reminds me of the water fluoridation <laughs> issue because I, I've done, I've worked two water fluoridation campaigns. And it's like, yeah. I swear to God, I hate to say this about my own country, but one fourth of all Americans are completely batshit crazy. I mean, they'll be down there, and you're, you're and 75 percent say, "Well, you know, if, if the Centers for Disease Control and the American Dental Association and the World Health Organization and and all the dentists, as you know, if you guys all agree, 75 percent say, well, it must be a good thing.' <laughs> and then 25 percent are like, "Well, the CDC is a conspiracy, and they're paid yeah. for by the aluminum industry." And it's like, "Wow, okay." So well, uh, the aluminum industry, because of the tinfoil hats, Howard. That's why <laughs> the aluminum. <laughs> wow. So, so you have a, an, an amazing online insurance course. Yeah. Uh, t talk about that. So it's, it's uh, for dental insurance coordinators. It's insurance skills training. So if you're looking to make the insurance coordinator a more robust area of your practice or a solid role for your practice. So I talked to you about how to do narratives, how to do appeals. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how to run the reports, how to have conversations with patients. It's four really meaty hours. So it's that's four. It's four separate hours. It's four separate hours, self-paced. Um, you can go back within a year to retake how, it. And how much is it? Five ninety-five. Um, what I wanted to tell you is, if if people are using Howard, the code Howard, they can get a, a courtesy off the book and a courtesy off of the course as well. So seventy-five dollars off the course, and then can three dollars. Can you put that in the tag of the the deal? So and so Ryan, so Ryan, on... three dollars off the book too for that. And I have an insurance coordinator workshop coming up October 13th in Northern Virginia. So use Howard and get $50 off of that. It's Friday the 13th. You know, you know what I would, if, you know what I think I would do if I was you, and this sounds self-serving, but it's not, it's just great marketing. Um, if you have four one hour courses, you should create a one hour course on dental town. We put up, uh, we put up about 450 courses on dental town and the, the, the baby boomers all read textbooks and go to courses and conventions. The millennials do it all on their iPad and all that kind of stuff. But we put up uh, about 450 courses. They're coming up on a million views. That's and amazing, so, so if you put one of those courses up and then you can sit there and say, by the way, if you go to odysseymanagement.com, I have four more hours. Boom. So you, you should... You should do a one-hour course on downtown, or if you're giving a lecture, you, yeah. you could film or tape that lecture, but put a lecture up just to build the brand, because Warren Buffett always says the same thing. He says, I'd rather be Coca-Cola. I'd rather start with Coca-Cola yeah. and not have a dollar. I'd rather start there, because he said with Coca-Cola, which he owns a third of, he goes, yeah. if you gave me a billion dollars and said, I want you to start Teresa Duncan Cola, and I'll give you a billion-dollar grant to go against Coca-Cola, he said, I'll give you your billion dollars back. So what yeah. you want more than anything is a brand name first. And so if you put that up on uh, Dentaltown, uh, that would, uh, I mean, you're a huge brand name. I'm not saying you're not, uh, you need any oh, help no, or anything. I, yeah, I appreciate but it's, that. Uh, I could certainly do an hour. Yeah, you know. do an hour on Dentaltown. Yeah. And, then, um, and then on your uh, deal, then that can be a disintermediate. The, um, um, you do your hour and then you say, by the way, I have four more hours if you go to Odyssey mgmt.com yeah. odysseymanagement.com did you think about going with Audi homer's odysseymanagement.com <laughs> yeah but you know i might get homer simpson confusion so <laughs> which sometimes i feel like when i'm talking about about this stuff with people so do i talk to ryan about the course then i'll hit up uh, no ryan. i'm i'm howard at dentaltown.com 
Okay. And the guy in charge of the online sea is Howard Goldstein. Right. So he goes by Hogo at dentaltown.com. Oh, no. okay. He's in Bethesda. Mar uh, he's in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Okay. So that's not too far. Yeah. All he, right. he, uh, I'll go he knock set up, on his door and tell him that. How far away up. are you from there? I have no idea. It's Pennsylvania is maybe a couple hours away. You know so why he uh, went to Bethlehem to practice? Because that's where Jesus was born. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, and I also I think, know, uh, podcast listeners can't see my face. I was like, <laughs> oh, dad joke. <laughs> um, well, no, it's funny because my, my two oldest sisters went to nunnery school, straight Catholic nunnery, straight out of high school. Really? And my oldest sister is probably the smartest person I've ever met in my life. I mean, she's a freak. And uh, she was telling me that, um, well, I don't want to get into, you should never talk about religion, sex, politics, violence, but Bethlehem is actually, you, you remember the, the Simpsons, what, what, what city was the Simpsons filmed in? You know, I don't, I don't watch a lot of Simpsons. It was Springfield, Missouri. Well, it's, they called it, they were in Springfield. You know why they went with Springfield? No. Because 43 of the 50 states all have a Springfield. It's the most <laughs> common name in all states. Well, exactly. every county in that area had a Bethlehem. So ah. there was a Bethlehem in every county. And then when archaeologists finally figured out the story of Jesus of Nazareth and all the archaeological evidence, where my mom went to see Bethlehem where baby Jesus was born, it's actually, mm -hmm. that's the wrong Bethlehem. He's from the Bethlehem in the next county. And my <laughs> sister, um, she does, she, you know, she just, it is what it is. She, you know, it doesn't bother her 1%. But it's so funny how... Uh, so many people, uh, you know, they built up this entire tourism industry That's to hilarious. go to Bethlehem to see where Jesus was born. And now the scientists are like, ah, it's actually uh, in the next county over. But uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, all, the, all the local tourist people are going, shh, don't say that. <laughs> and also, um, there's, uh, you know, we um, we own Dental Town. We own um, Height. And we also own um, Ortho Town. There's a lot of orthodontists listening to this show. Um, you do... Um, staff appreciation you you do referring office appreciation training uh yeah. to come in so if you're an orthodontist and you got 25 people that refer to you you know the average orthodontist did 1 million in collections netted 320 and most of those orthodontists i'll tell you about 20 offices 25 offices uh are referring everything um right. what, what what's so tell them what you do for uh referring offices yeah, so this is actually a lot of fun for me. So I'll have a specialist that will call me and say, I want to put on an appreciation course. The number one topic that they're hearing about the pain point is insurance. So how about bringing in a speaker that tells you how to be more profitable, how to be more efficient with your insurance? They bring me in for the day. You know, I talk about how great the doctor is, too, because most of the time I, I they are really good doctors because they want to bring in something for their referring office. I teach them how to be more efficient. Talk about the doctor. Doctor gets their time in front. You know, they're pressing the flesh. They're getting to know their people again. The staff comes together, which is really important because a lot of times when you've got uh, regular general dentists, the staff is a lot of times the one who grabs the referral pad. So you want to get the staff to know each other and to feel comfortable with each other. So it really, it's been a really good thing. I'd love to do more of those. I love speaking on the big stages, but there's something about that 70, 50 to 75 mark people it's a real intimate conversation. I love that. So yeah. So if, if specialists are looking to do a thank you to their uh, referring offices, that's, I, I would love to do nothing but that, but there is something nice about being up on the bigger stage though. I think you know that, you know, a little something about well, that. Actually they bring me in for the exact opposite. They bring me for the non-appreciation for the dentists <laughs> who don't refer. And then I just abuse them for like four hours and they go home psychologically traumatized. Well, hey, let's, um, do, let's do a let's do a dual class where you're in one room haranguing them and I'm in the other room building them up and we'll just switch. <laughs> oh, my God. And then what's funny is when I go into dentistry, you know, so many people are like, oh, my God, you know, I can't believe he said that or, you know, that was, you know, or, or someone will walk out. Then when I go do stand up here in Phoenix and Tempe and Scottsdale, any comedy club, they go, God, dude, you're the cleanest act in town. You didn't say the F word, no sex jokes. No. So when I'm in stand up. I'm the cleanest that Polly Shore's mother told me. I'll never forget what she told me. She saw me in uh, um, in uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard, and she said, you know, the people that all go to the top are G. I mean, think about it. Um, mm -hmm. Letterman. Uh, what's the guy yeah. of uh, Seinfeld? Uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, all, all the people. Bill Cosby. I mean, you know, um, all the top. The people that make it to the very top are all the cleanest. She said, you're that guy. 
you're so clean. And then I spent my whole life in dentistry, they go, I don't know. That was kind of raunchy. You said fart. It's like fart. Fart's <laughs> still rated G. You can say damn shit and go to hell. You're still PG. Well, you know, there's something to be said. Fart's a funny word. I have a teenage boy. Fart is an everyday word in our house. You know how that goes. <laughs> Uh, well, you know why when I fart, you know why I like it to make a little noise. For, it's it's for the hearing impaired, and uh, you know <laughs> they, so, they should get in on that too. And so uh, but anyway, so, um, hey, seriously, um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you email Hogo, and my homies can no. uh, see you online. I know the the millennials will love it. Uh, you got to order your book, and uh, the the bottom line is uh, I know that you're a dentist, so all you hear is that all the patients want same-day dentistry, same-day dentistry, same-day dentistry. But after being a dentist 30 years, and when I tell Miss Teresa Duncan that she needs a crown, half the patients go to fear, like, oh, my God, are you going to give me a shot? Is this going to hurt? Can you knock me out? Do you have nitrous? The other half go to fear of cost, like, oh, my God, how much is it? I don't get paid till Friday. Do you take my insurance? And if I was going to be a successful dentistry, I wouldn't be focusing on CAD cam and chair side milling and lasers and all this high tech stuff. I would I would want you to crush a chair side manner from all your staff. Every touch point. The lady Excellent. opened the phone. Thank you for calling today's dental. This is Valerie. How may I help you? And answer yeah. every call by the third ring. And when they come in, the hygienist is nice. The assistant's nice. I want the chair side manner, and then I want you to be empathetic towards pain and cost. And insurance is a huge part of the cost equation. And nobody ever said, oh, you should go to my gynecologist. She has a laser. And, uh, <laughs> and then you should, go, you should go to my physician because he has a, a super duper laser. Nobody <laughs> talks about equipment except dentist. No right. one else in healthcare talks about equipment. There's not an oncologist in the world. Oh, let me treat your prostate cancer. I have a laser. <laughs> Um, you know, they, you know just, what they, talk they, about? they talk about not being ripped off. That's what they say. They're good people. They'll tell you the truth. They're not going to rip you off. That's what I want. That's what I want our conversations to be completely honest, completely clear. And then that way we we're doing right by the patient at the end of the day. That's what it's all about. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming to the show. Look forward to putting an online C course. And, uh, and if you're an orthodontist out there, Bring in me and Teresa. Teresa, for all the referrals that you love, and for me, for all the bastards that never refer to you, to just abuse <laughs> them all day. All right. Let's have a rocking hot day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Howard.